Top five debt-free disasters. Are they really disasters? I think they could be. Just because I'm debt-free doesn't mean all of my problems are solved. What's some of the impact of me being debt-free and, and especially when it's related to my true goal, which is maybe legacy or income or, um, you know, wealth or generational wealth? What, what are those? What's the impact to the true goal based off the fact that as of today, I am debt-free? And so just kind of give the answer to the test before uh, before we kind of go through it. It's opportunity cost, meaning um, what are those opportunities may that you may have missed in the midst of becoming debt free? Meaning how much time did it take? And in the midst of that time, what were some of those opportunities that came about that, you know what, you just weren't able to take advantage of? Oh, and by the way, the opportunities don't don't get cheaper. Right. And then there's time, 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 the uh, number of compound cycles it required for you to become debt free. What would have happened if you put those uh, compound cycles to work? Inflation. We talk about this a lot on this channel, and that is a dollar today is not the same dollar tomorrow. So just because you're debt free, if you're not putting your money to work, if you're not putting that cash flow to work, what's the impact on how inflation can impact your ability to stay, remain debt free or remain retired uh, in the future? And then leverage. So if I am, if I um if we're talking about paying off a home and for whatever the reason I am no longer I no longer have that mortgage available or it's no longer impacting my ability to uh, have to pay this mortgage payment, how am I able to leverage? Where is the leverage coming from? And how am I able to use that leverage to hit my goal? And then the last piece is the ability to qualify. And this one is has layers. So it's the ability to, uh, you know, the impact on the impact debt free has on credit, the impact debt free has on your ability to qualify for different things when uh, you need to to advance or, or, or move things forward. So that's kind of what we're highlighting today and kind of starts out with a quick example. And this example is related to Miles and Layla. Um, so in, in this gentleman, he actually reached out to me. He's 37 years of age. And again, to kind of harp on the, the point that Angelique was making around people feeling nervous or having a concern that somehow they'll be judged when they meet with me. So a 37 year old having his home paid off to me is a huge feat. But he was concerned about meeting with me because he thought that I was going to view that differently. When to me, I think it took him from age 30 to 37 to pay his home off. So to have a, a his home, and I want to say it's 300 plus thousand dollars. I didn't really get into those details because those details didn't matter. But to have his home paid off at the age of 37 to me is monumental. And he um, has free and clear cash flow, meaning just specifically related to no longer having a mortgage. Not having that mortgage gave him uh, additional cash flow of around a thousand dollars a month. And he's been putting away over this last period, over these last seven years and built up a nest egg of about 55,000 sitting in his savings. And so outside of that, you know, if you got the company's 401k, they've got other vehicles, other things that they have in play. But the main conversation today was around, hey, I'm debt free. And I saw your video around now what? And I started to think, started to become concerned. What is it that uh, I should be doing with the, these funds? And how much time did I lose because I've decided because I decided to pay off my home? I think just the first thing that should be acknowledged is kudos to this gentleman and his wife for paying off their home in seven years. Pretty powerful. And the now what was them realizing, like, we've arrived at the place where the majority of people are hoping to arrive to. And we're going. It's not it's not even the. Um, what happens next? It's what we thought was going to be the case after these seven years is not the case. Right. So that's kind of what we're also going to talk about was we were saying the what, what then, or what next? What do you, what do you say? Now what? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> and so from an opportunities uh, cost perspective, again, being debt free and it taking seven years to get there, that's one thing. But what could have happened? What were the opportunities within that seven year period that may have passed by? And, um, you know, so, you know, I talk a lot about a secure compound interest account. What would it look like had that secure compound interest account started earlier, started seven years earlier? Where would they be at this point in relation to their true goal? But in order to understand the true goal, we have to kind of peel that back. And so that's kind of where this conversation started around. Now what? Meaning now that we are, quote unquote, debt free 
and we no longer have a mortgage payment and we've got this consistent cash flow that we are saving, we are putting it away, but what does this look like? Now, what, what is the opportunity to be able to put this money to work? And in the midst of putting that uh, money to work, it kind of brings up the second item, which is cycles, time. What's the impact of waiting seven years before I get started? Instead of starting here, we, only, we start at age 37. And again, if we're talking about a secure compound interest account, putting our money to work and making it work for us, where there's a difference in the impact of time. But to me, that's not even a relevant conversation to be having here because what's the likelihood of this 30 year old having enough cash flow to be able to start a secure compound interest producing vehicle? So, you know, that that's a that's a fact that I think he was concerned that, uh, you know, based off all of the videos he's watched with us, he was concerned that that was somehow going to be impactful or somehow going to make a difference as to um, what that conversation looked like, meaning I was going to jump on him because he missed an opportunity to start seven years earlier with uh, building wealth. But to me, I don't know that he would be in the same position had he not done what he did. I don't know he'd, if he would be in the same position had he not adopted some of the, uh, I'll call it the um, the teachings of the Dave Ramseys of the world that said, you know what, credit is bad and, and, and you know, leverage is bad and, and focus on paying off your debt. Like, I'm not mad at the fact that, hey, yeah, maybe he did lose seven years, but still he is 37 years old and he's debt free. Now, what does that look like? But yes, the truth of the matter is there there is time does have an impact. There is an impact to the amount of compound cycles that are available to him. Um, and so if he was 57 years of age at this time, meaning if he had the same opportunity at age 50 and then by age 57, we're talking, we're having this conversation. It's a different conversation because now he's, he has less compound cycles to be able to be able to hit his goal. So, you know, Again, when you're starting and how you're starting and what those variables are, all of that matters. And I think for this particular person's situation, I don't see it as a factor because he has the time available to be able to make up for that time lost. And then, let me start here. And then there's the, what he's currently doing with the money that he has available. So what he's currently doing is he's got that thousand dollars a month that he's been putting into savings and he's amassed the savings of somewhere around fifty five thousand dollars. So he's got this fifty five thousand dollars that's continuously growing, putting away a thousand dollars a month into it. And he didn't say it was a high yield savings account. So rather than take the uh, perspective of something less than one percent, I just assumed that his fifty five thousand is making one percent over time. So he's putting his twelve thousand dollars away. But what would that twelve thousand dollars look like? at retirement age. Is this enough to be able to put him in a position to where any income that he's able to generate off putting this $12,000 away, is it enough for him to be able to, um, is it enough for him to be able to beat inflation? And so the other thought around that is he's also in addition to the thousand dollars a month that he's putting into savings, he's also maxing out his IRA. I'm not sure if it's Roth or traditional, but I just call it a traditional IRA. He's maxing that out. And so at the time it was roughly $6,500 a year, but as of now, it's actually $7,000 a year that he's able to put away. So when I was kind of breaking down those calculations for him, I went ahead and used the 7,000 throughout this period of time. But again, what we know about traditional vehicles like this, and again, this is how, this is what he was taught. This is how it's communicated in those Dave Ramsey communities. You know, as you're following the baby steps, it is absolutely get that IRA started um, and max out that IRA once you've paid off all your debt. So he was just following the plan as though the plan was prescriptive. Um, and so the thought process is, hey, is this going to be enough for you to be able to retire? And whenever I'm sitting in a space um, having conversations about IRAs, that's always my stance. It is is putting away $6,500 a year or $7,000 a year or $8,000 a year. Is that sufficient enough for you to be able to build enough wealth over time to be able to retire? That part. Yeah, it's it's why, because so many people, I don't care where you are, what platform you're on, you do at least three or four scrolls. You're going to hear somebody talking about a Roth IRA. What they're not talking about are limitations like this that make it impossible for this to be the um, 
pay the taxes on the seeds. Well, if you're only planting two or three seeds, darling, what are you eating? What's the harvest? Right. What are you excited about? And there's still a risk involved in whether or not the seeds that you plant are actually going to grow into uh, fruit, trees, whatever the case is. But what if you plant a couple seeds and then all you get are those little weird carrots? Nobody wants those. Nobody's eating on those like, hooray, maybe if you're starving. But if you get the little weird ones, you're just like, ah, I thought this was going to be a big, beefy one I want to take a picture of. But that's not always the case. You don't know until you are till it's done growing because you can't keep digging it up to go look at it, right? And that's kind of the the case here is that if you're only planting a few seeds, then it matters greatly each and every one of them. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It matters greatly. If you are only if you're planting a whole bunch of them though and you know that they are going to multiply like Green onions, for instance, they multiply, right? You you plant one and then boop, 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 boop. Garlic's the same. You get a whole bunch more. But these are not the case. And so that's why it these are talking points that are so popular and they're trendy and they get people views. But you need to know why they're not necessarily um, the end-all, be-all and everything that people are gassing them up to be. The factor around putting away the max inside of an IRA or Roth IRA and putting yourself in a position to where you can retire. Is that possible? Absolutely. It is. Millions of people do it all the time. But let's ha let's have some real truth around what that means, though, because of this little thing called the four percent rule. What do you need to have inside of that Roth IRA for it to be able to produce the income that you're needing? And that's the part that people usually miss, meaning IRAs do a pretty good job of um. Uh, I'll call it accumulating net worth. IRAs do a pretty good job of amassing wealth, but they do a horrible job of distributing wealth. They do a horrible job of producing income. So even if you are able to produce a um, a Roth IRA that puts your puts you in a position to where you can, I'll call it, produce the income or not produce the income, put, put your money in a Roth IRA that allows it to build to enough inside of it, like a million dollars. You think that million dollars is going to produce something that can actually replace your job only to learn that's $40,000 a year. And then when you throw inflation on top of that, what is, how does, how is that even impacted? And so what I really learned from this gentleman is this was a true goal, meaning, and how about this? Shouldn't it be a goal? Meaning I'm 30, I'm 30 years old. I'm paying off my home. I paid off my home by 37. Shouldn't a reward for me getting rid of the largest debt that I, that most of us have Getting rid of that large debt put us in a position to where we could actually fire our job at some point. Like, shouldn't that be a part of the 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 um, I'll call it end end of that equation? Yeah. But like show me the retirement that. vehicle. Show me the traditional retirement vehicle that will allow you to do that. Yeah. If they can achieve that, why can't they retire early? Right. And you're right because forty thousand dollars a year and uh, 35 years from now, which would be like the retirement age that he could start drawing that from would be the equivalent of $14,000 today. Right. Nobody's, what are you doing? Paying your light bills with that? Cause that's really all you're doing is paying utility bills when you're retired. It's not enough. It's not enough. And I think, and to that point around the beating inflation part, it's, it's understanding what, if the goal is to retire early, what is that number? What is the value that you need at that point in time? And doing the math around, okay, if the if what I'm going to need is $150,000, $200,000 a year in income based off the fact that a dollar today looks way different tomorrow, then what are those vehicles that are going to hit get me there? So I work backwards from that $200,000 to understand what are those things that I need to put in place today at age 37? Yeah, I'm I'm debt free from the fact from the position of I don't have a mortgage, but what do I need to be doing right now today in order to be able to hit that dollar amount in the future is the key. Yeah, and Nate, to Nathan's point, don't forget it's also taxed. Right, because again, this is an an IRA and not a Roth IRA. So you're right. That means that when he start when he's ready to take a distribution, again, call, calling out that million dollars that less than two percent of Americans actually achieve inside their retirement account. Let's say he actually is able to hit it because he's already doing things that he's in that percentile of people that are are, are hard to reach as it relates to paying off your home. So let's say they make it into that uh, under two percent. You're right. There's still going to be a tax impact on top of the 4% rule. And then leverage. So becoming debt free, 
how does this, how does your ability to have leverage or use leverage, how is that impacted? Because usually I've, I've had this conversation like three times this week already around, hey, I don't have, I'm, I'm debt free. So therefore I don't like to accumulate debt because I've become accustomed to not having debt. The idea of me having a home equity line of credit and leveraging some debt to be able to either pay a bill or generate wealth, that's hard for me to wrap my head around. And so having, um, you know, your, your assets being free and clear and your savings being healthy. But what is that impact of your ability to be able to leverage the asset you have to be able to generate wealth? It is, it is greatly impacted. Not only to mention if you, if it's the leverage that's impacted, how do you get the leverage? Well, you have to qualify for it. And so in your ability to be able to, um, you know, cause one of the first things that happens when you pay off a large debt is your credit score drops. So what happens when you pay off your home? So at age 37, what happened to uh, this couple once they paid off their home? You know, the credit score dropped. And if you listen to any of the baby steppers, you're supposed to be okay with that. You're supposed to be okay with the fact that, uh, matter of fact, your credit score dropping actually means you're doing the right thing. But if you the don't goal need to use credit, to, right? Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. So if the, but if the goal is to be able to leverage your home because it's free and clear to be able to put you in a position to where you can actually generate income, then how easy will it be for you to be able to qualify for some of those items to be able to do that? So what, so what are they doing if you've paid off your home and now you have retired? Because in the beginning, when we were talking about this, the debt-free disasters, the idea of being debt-free is only great in theory, but when you realize all of the other things that come along with it, you go, why would I have chosen this? Because now I can't move anywhere. This was about freedom. And now I feel more imprisoned because of this situation than ever before. I'm debt free and I cannot make moves. I cannot do what I want to do. I cannot go where I want to go. And this asset that I thought was great and wonderful is now locked up in a prison and I have to have, have permission to get it. They, the banks don't care how responsible it was of me to pay this off so early and have been debt free for those for so long. You would think that that is what the credit, your credit score would go up because you did all that, right? That you would be, that you'd be, um, uh, rewarded for that, but you're, but it, you're not. So what are they doing? These people who have already done this because the concept of being debt-free, fire, retire early, baby steps, all of this have been around for decades. So what are people doing now when they've already done this? Paid off their home and they get to this point. Right. And in this couple's, I guess in this couple's example, uh, what are they currently doing? What they're doing is they're taking the, because so uh, now that the debt is paid off, hey, I'm free and clear here, but I've got this $1,000 a month that I'm able to put to work. And I've got this IRA, I mean, yeah, this IRA that I'm able to put to work as well. So what is happening with that $55,000 that's growing on top of the uh, $1,000 a month that I have, as well as how is that IRA performing? And this is actually great performance over time. What we're talking about is a, what I looked at is a 20 year span. So from age 37 to 57, what does it look like over time inside of a vehicle like this? So I think they're doing a good job of putting their money to work. But the question is, when it's time to retire, meaning if the objective is to retire early and you're sitting here with a, an asset worth $458,000 in, in an IRA and $333,000 as it relates to your savings account at age 57, does that equate to what it is you need to be able to retire? I don't think that's a shabby number, but the truth around the income part is it's it's not. It's, it's not the dollar amount that you think it is, nor is it the dollar amount you need, either based off inflation or just time in general. And I think that's the that, that's the part where we just have to be realistic around what does this math look like? If the goal is to retire early, what is the income I need to be able to achieve that? Okay, is the question. Here, here's, and here's the, and, this is, this is the question. We're going to show you how to answer this question. So that's, that's first off, but what are people doing? What does this look like in reality in 2024? What does it look like when people have hit this goal already? They are retired. Maybe they hit their, their, their million dollar goal. And so now they're figuring out, okay, I don't have my uh, mortgage payment anymore. Now I just have the cost of living. And if, as long as I can live within a fixed budget, right? Maybe they're calling it fixed income. 
But that's not always the case either because just because you think that maybe $3,000 is enough, wait till that HOA increases, right? Now, now it's not necessarily the, about the fixed income. It's, it's about a fixed budget, right? That's a different word. So if, what are they doing? What they're doing is they're trying to get the equity out of their home without having to qualify because they can't qualify because the terms of being able to qualify make this so costly at this point. Instead of being able to qualify for a lower interest rate, now they have to agree to a much higher interest rate with different terms. They've got to have money down. Well, where are they getting the money down, right? To essentially enter into a new agreement. This is where reverse mortgage comes in. This is where those HEA plans come in. And what this means is there is the potential for you to lose your home. So you spend all that time paying it off. You spend all that time not, not going on vacation, um, not creating memories with your family because you got so serious about this goal. Like this was the, your isolated focus, right? To be debt free, this was the goal. Whatever makes the boat go faster towards being debt free. Those were the questions you were answering yes to. And so you achieve that goal. And later on, you feel like this is the ultimate win. We are here. We're proud. We're toasting it up with our friends who are still making those mortgage payments. Ha ha, you should have been debt. We're debt free, right? And now they are stuck and at the mercy of whatever it is that is available to them that they could qualify for to be able to get the leverage just to have enough to survive. These HEAs, these reverse mortgages, could also mean that now you lose your home. So this is now no longer part of your legacy. This is now no longer part of your asset. This is just a vehicle that you have to leverage to survive. And somebody else is going to get the benefit of it because you were in a situation where you could not qualify and leverage your own asset and use it as leverage, right? Uh, the other thing that they're doing is they're selling it off to their kids. What they don't see coming, though, are the capital gains ca taxes that come from that. Because they paid their home off in 1997 or 2005 or whenever it was, and now it has grown to this value, all they want is maybe the, you know, $250,000, $400,000 out of this house that they're going, if we were to sell this house, we have all this equity, we need to be able to use this money, but we don't want to lose this home. So we're going to sell it. We're going to get the equity out, whatever this is. Let's make it make sense and keep it in the family, right? We're also going to keep all them taxes in the family where we're all paying taxes unnecessarily because we didn't structure this properly. But again, once you're there, you these are the only options that you have. And so you have to work with what you've got. At this point, there is no judgment. It's just what is available to you. So what are people doing once they've hit this, this point? They are grasping at straws and they are just trying to survive. The rest of them are going back to work. That's the part. They're going back to work. Because how do you solve, how do you resolve any of those issues that you just highlighted? It's we have to get more revenue coming into the home. We have to increase the income. And so therefore we have to go back to work. I'm, I have, I've been free and clear in this home but because I didn't put my money to work for me or the vehicle that I did put my money in work for me didn't necessarily accomplish or achieve the goal that I was looking for, now I have to go back to work. And therefore, that whole retire early thought process is gone. So specifically, what I just wanted to highlight was this is what if they continue on the path that they're on, this is what this would look like. What I just wanted to highlight was what if starting here, we just took a different approach and we know some things we know at age 37. Find it at age 37, they've got about 55k in savings, and they've got about a thousand dollars a month in cash flow. So, if, if they've got fifty thousand dollars in savings and a thousand dollars a month in cash flow, what would this look like if they put it to work? And again, this thousand dollars isn't. Uh, this is additional cash flow, meaning this thousand dollars isn't um, based off some velocity banking action or what's left over after they pay bills, because that's already going towards um, um, that, that's actually what's feeding savings and also what's going into their IRA. So they have cash flow in addition to this thousand dollars a month. So it's what would happen if we put this thousand dollars a month to work. And so what I just wanted to highlight is what would that look like? So and what I did was I ran this over a um, 20 year period. So age, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Age 37 till 57, 
what does it look like to be able to put a thousand dollars a month to work and a fifty thousand dollar lump sum? And the thing to remember about this calculator is that fifty thousand uh, dollars in a lump sum is actually split in half. So it's twenty five thousand year one, twenty five thousand year two. So if they were actually in a position to put in all fifty thousand in year one, these numbers I'm about to show you would actually be much greater. But again, just allowing the uh, the calculator to do its thing, splitting the lump sum, twenty five thousand year one and year two, and putting away a thousand dollars a month. What does that look like? Well, at the end of the twenty year period, we would be talking about one hundred eight thousand dollars tax free for life, and a nest egg, a cash value of nine hundred thirty seven. And again, if you were to um, add these two numbers up. Again, this is the 458,000 inside of a, uh, an IRA and another 333,000 inside of that uh, that uh, savings account. We're still only talking about 750,000. So at a minimum, the cash value is higher. But in addition to that, the amount of income that's able to that is able to be taken out of this vehicle is significant significantly higher as well. And so it's just simply putting your money to work sooner. And I think again, the concern that this gentleman was had around meeting with me was he thought I was going to harp on the fact that he lost seven years, meaning he lost the compound cycle. So let's look at what that would look like. If the same thought process started at age 30, what would this look like? So, okay. Yes. It, it's a significant amount more income, $214,000 in tax-free income, $2 million in cash value, very, very significant. Like, please, I'm not saying that that's not something that he should have should should be thriving for. But let's be realistic. With that cash flow been available at that time, would that savings have been available at that time? Probably not. So maybe this didn't look like a thousand dollars a month. Maybe it looked more like five hundred dollars a month even. So what would something like that look like? Again, it would still be more than what he has today, meaning putting your money to work as soon as possible is still the key, but it doesn't have to be the end all be all. I think the the, the best position you can be in is, hey, do I have enough cash flow to be able to put it away and allow it to do its thing while also being able to pay, pay my bills and, and continue to live my life? And I think that's the message. If nothing else, it's really more about uh, not not necessarily about starting. Uh, it's not not necessarily about whether or not you should or shouldn't start. It's when you do. And it's, it's based off where you are, regardless of how much you have, regardless of uh, what some of the actions that you may have taken prior to today, it's your, hey, you're, you're, where you are now and what is it that you can put to work? What, what money can you get compounding for you to be able to put yourself in a much better, uh, a much better position? And I think the only other piece I wanted to kind of highlight here is the fact that we also talk, he talked about contributing to an IRA. So the question is, what if also, instead of continuing to contribute into that IRA, what would it look like if he was taking that same, what was it, uh, $7,000 a year, I think is what I, I had calculated. So at $7,000 a year, instead of it going, instead of that money going into an IRA, what if that $7,000 a year went into a vehicle like this on top of the $1,000 a month that was being contributed? And I think $7,000 divided by 12, so we're talking about 583 bucks. So if there was another, let's just simply call it $1,500 that was able to go into a vehicle like this. Sorry. What does that look like over time? And again, starting, leaving it at the age of 37, which is where he is today. If that was able to happen, again, from a retire early perspective, Name another vehicle that would put your money in a position to where by age 57, you would have anywhere close to $145,000 tax-free, $1.2 million in cash value. And from a legacy perspective, about $4.7 million in death benefit if something were to happen to you around the age of 55. Because again, the IRA, you can't touch it till 59. So by age 57, it is not happening. And the um, in both of those accounts that he currently has, the uh, the 401k, I'm sorry, not the 401k, the IRA and this high yield savings account, both of these dollar amounts, when you go to take a distribution from both of those dollar amounts, those are uh, one taxable as it relates to your IRA, but they're also withdrawals. Meaning if you don't have a vehicle that can outperform what it is you're taking as a withdrawal, how do you uh, replenish? 
How do you make sure you don't run out of money? How do you make sure you don't, you're not putting yourself in a position to where you may have to go back to work? And I think that's the piece that um, Angelique was making before. And that is making sure that not only do you have a vehicle that is building wealth for you and putting you in a position to where it can generate income, but is it sustainable enough to where you don't have to go back to work? Is it sustainable enough to where uh, you can continue to live off of it and it not uh, be depleted, whether it's due to inflation or time, um, you know, based off the dollar that dollar amount that you have. And the cool part about this, and this is something that we rarely talk about on, uh, when we're walking through the cal- uh, the calculations in this calculator, and that is this hundred eight thousand is not a withdrawal, meaning it's based off this nine hundred thirty seven thousand. But what is it comprised of? This is leverage. What we're saying here is you can take a distribution of somewhere around 11% of this number. And you can take that 11% for the rest of your life because this 937 is making somewhere around 13, 14, 15%. So if you're making 13% inside of a vehicle like this and you're taking a distribution of 11, all you're doing is living off the interest. And because you're living off the interest, the likelihood of you somehow running out of money or the likelihood of the um, the cash value being depleted is less likely because you're not eating into that cash value when you start to take that income. The other one other piece to touch on is making sure that when we meet, when we're talking through what those opportunities are, it's having clarity around what is the goal. Is it passive income? Is it the to replace your expenses? And when we talk about replacing your expenses, that's where we dig into the uh, reverse velocity banking opportunities. Uh, is it replace a certain amount of your income uh, in retirement? And ultimately, is it about control? Is it about being able to leverage what you have to be able to produce what it is you need? And the examples of why would be creating generational wealth. Having more than just, um, you know, more than just an amount to survive for the future, meaning how many people do you know that are ending up going back to work because they are they are concerned about running out of uh, money in retirement. So it's more than just surviving for the future, but it's putting yourself in a position to where this vehicle will produce income on a continuous basis. And the last piece, which is a very significant piece, and that is being able to beat inflation. Being able to account for, regardless of what happens in the future, I've got a vehicle that, at a minimum, will sustain itself to help me be able to compete with inflation. And just a a quick reminder, the calculator does not account for that math, meaning the calculator itself does not account for inflation, so we have to do that work. We have to put in what does that number look like uh, that we need in the future, meaning how much. What is that math? And based off that math, we work backwards using the... um, um, inflation calculator to understand wait, what that wait, what that wait, means. Don't, Go ahead. Wait, wait, don't leave here. Don't leave. Don't leave. Yeah, don't leave. Don't okay. Leave. The reason I put myself over the what mm-hmm. is because there is a difference in when people say this is my goal, and we had a whole, I think, two live streams about this, but I'm gonna double down on it tonight. The what is different than the why. A lot of people, when you say what's your goal, what's the goal? What is the purpose of doing all this? They list their why. They're not listing the what. And we say it all the time. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there because it's just been so normalized to do all that you can. And then it's like a, it's like bingo or like um, a game, like the game of life. You do all that you can and then you get to find out like the big reveal, door number one, what is behind there for you? Like, what did you win after all of the all of the effort versus the doing it this way is you are deciding the what now. You are not leading with your why. You are you you have your why, that's fine. That's an important factor. You want to safeguard against inflation. So therefore you know the what has to be passive tax-free income for life and that uh, you need to replace 100% of your expenses. Well, what are those today? And what will right. those be just based on inflation that you can at least plan for? At minimum, just have a standard that you're planning for. That's where the how much, the what is how much. The what has to have a number. The what is uh, when you are looking at when I retire, it's not retire early, it's retire with X amount of dollars per year no matter what happens, right. I get to have this income and I know that this is going to be coming for me. I can depend on it and I don't have to qualify for it, right? 
These are all very different conversations than what we're used to. This isn't somebody gives you the permission to, well, you know what? You didn't make it this year, maybe in another two or three years. How frustrating is it? And how many times have we ran into somebody like this, right? At a doctor's office, somebody doing their job and they are there not because they want to be there because they love to serve. They're there because they thought they were going to be retiring two or three years ago, and they're still there. And so now at this point, they're just showing up because they have to. That is completely different, and that is not a place to serve from. If you feel like you have done all, your everything in your might, if you feel like you've done everything that you can possibly do, and then there's somebody that gets to tell you, mm, maybe later, right? It's like when you ask your parents, and they go, oh, we'll think about it. You know that's a no. You know that's a no, and they have to say yes, and so you are just waiting, but they don't understand how important it is, that's the moment. We never leave that when we are following these traditional systems. We are constantly going to somebody for them to go, let me think about it. And I think this is where we take the control back. This is where we, this is adulting for real, right? This is not having to have permission. And that is leading with your what. You get out of that by knowing your what first and you have your why to help remind you of why every day you are headed towards your what and that it's going to be a reality so but but there's also a reduction in in anxiety like how many how many people who are currently in retirement today watch the market on a continuous basis like they stay on CNBC or whatever that that network might be trying to understand how their 401k is doing today they had a good day right then they had a bad day right right or we change presidents. There's an election coming up. Who is who is quite excited around this election coming up and the impact on uh, potentially on the retirement during that period? Like no one. Yeah. So it's the objective a- is to take more control to be able to put your money in a position to where those types of factors have less impact. Okay. So now, how do we find our what? Let's let's show them that part. That's the next part. Yeah. Boop. And it's really no different than what we talk about as it relates to velocity banking. It's understanding where you are. It's understanding your numbers. It's understanding what is that income today and what does it need to be at, at, in a, at a future, at a, at a later date or a future point. And in addition, it's adding in or making sure we account for inflation. So it's, it's putting the dollar amount inside of the calculator to understand what it's going to look like in the future and what actions need to be taken to make sure we compensate for that number. And here's a, here's a, here's an absolute fact. Sometimes that number is pretty daunting. And so the truth is, um, is it 100% possible to be able to hit whatever that inflation number is in the future? Maybe it's not, but at least you know what that number is today and you can put your best foot forward to be able to do so. So therefore you at least get closer to it than you would have had you not paid any attention to it at all. So it's putting yourself in a position to where at least you have, again, it's the control part. It's less about the anxiety of, wow, I'm now 62 years old. I'm thinking about retiring at 65 only to learn that in three years, I cannot accumulate enough to be able to do so. But learning that at 37, you know what? At 65, man, that's a significant number that I need to focus on. So in truth, what I need to do is make sure I'm putting my money in the best position today to be able to get as close to that number as possible. So I'm taking that effort now while I have the uh, compound cycles available to be able to do so. And I think this is where those multi, there's a lot of new builders who are doing the multi-generational builds. They have the, maybe it's like a guest suite for parents or your mother-in-law suite or whatever they're, they're calling it could even be for your your kids to stay and ha- feel like they have their sense of independence there's a lot of multi-generational um, living spaces being built and there's conversions happening with even just uh, larger homes that have you know six seven bedrooms these are now turning into assisted living facilities or more like a, a cohort type of situation where adults are living all together. What do, they, what do they call that? You guys know the words. So put that in the chat for everyone else who doesn't, if you don't mind. It's This is a thing. It's becoming a thing. And the reason why is because people are realizing that 
just spending the money just to have my own address, just spending the money to live by myself when I'm only there to sleep and I'm not really doing anything else, spending the money on um, the Netflix for me to just have it when we have now six or seven people, it kind of feels like the real world. It kind of feel, might, might feel more like a college situation or it feels like people who are wanting to be more financially responsible and they realize that having your own place isn't what it's all cracked up to be when at the end of the day, all you're doing is working to survive and you don't have anything left over. And I think there has to be a change. So for some people, it's this younger generation just trying to get off their feet. So they're trying to make different decisions. For some of them, it's the next generation, well, you know, millennials who are trying to get ahead so that they can eventually retire, crossing their fingers, right? Like this could happen for me. And then the other part are um, Gen X who we realized too late, like, I, okay, we weren't having this conversation before, but now I realize like it's a real thing because it's like knocking at my door and I'm realizing I do not want to be dependent and I cannot depend on the things I thought were going to be a factor. This is where that debt-free conversation is starting to play its role in their lives because they realize they played themselves by playing into this, this ideology. And the third one are the boomers who are now realizing they didn't have enough, they can't, some of them can't even qualify to go back to work, and now what do they do? Or you gotta get some, move in to the retirement house. <laughs>